Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jonathan McBride. My pronouns are he, him. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Staff Pride Network for LGBT plus colleagues and allies. Uh, and we're very grateful to have, uh, have you all joining us this evening and grateful to have our wonderful speakers uh, and uh, for our social events officer, uh, Sarah Bernard, to have put so much effort into organizing this event uh, and uh, the team. Uh, and the, um, social uh the uh, social events team and the communications and media officers uh, as well put a lot of effort so i just wanted to give them a little shout out um staff pride network is set up to support uh students and staff uh phd pgr um professional services uh, academics um and we do this in many different ways at present uh, if you're interested in finding out more, uh, if you'd like to get involved, if you'd like to get a bit activisty, uh, we have several volunteering roles uh, available. Uh, so do get uh, do get in touch, and uh, we can see uh, what uh, might suit and what you'd like to do. Uh, I will pass over to Sarah and I to uh, host the rest of the event, and. Uh, Hope you enjoy this evening and do join us for our other events uh, for uh, tomorrow lunchtime for staff and students, university people and uh, the 23rd and 24th, uh, both at five o'clock, five till six. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Barnard. My pronouns are she, they, uh, and I'm the social events officer at um, the Staff Pride Network, as, as I think Jonathan said, but just to reiterate, um, I'm in very blue lighting, but I'm going to pretend it's like bisexual lighting and is like completely intentional. <laughs> so yeah, uh, really excited to have some uh, colleagues from the university here to talk about queer theory. Um, this is the first of our LGBT History Month events um, in the UK, February is LGBT History Month and um, we're encouraged to take part in the, this, this is theme is blurring borders and so we're exploring the waves of LGBT li liberation and community across the globe. Um, because we're situated within the university and because theory, research and big ideas are informed and inform our lived experiences, and because queer theory has its own rich LGBTQ history, today we're asking, what is queer theory? Um, and I thought that would be something really interesting to explore. And to explore it with us today, I have Dr. Ray Rosenberg and Professor Sharon Cowan, and I'm gonna hand over to them and let them introduce themselves and do a much better job of it than I ever could because I know that they've got dozens of excellent credentials and achievements that they will be very happy to share with us uh, right now. <laughs> Let's start with Sharon, if that's okay. So hi everyone, thanks for inviting me along today and happy LGBTQ History Month. Um, I am the Professor of Feminist and Queer Legal Studies in the Law School at Edinburgh University. Um, we can talk about how that title came about at some point later if you'd like. Um, I do research um, cutting across criminal law and asylum and refugee law, mostly centred around gender, sex and sexuality, um, and looking at issues of specifically to do with asylum, uh, claims built on sexual orientation and uh, trans identity and also other issues around sexual violence and equality for trans people. So um, I've been working in that area for about, actually I'm not going to tell you because it will tell you how old I am <laughs> and I'll feel, I'll feel sad, but um, yeah, for quite a long time. And uh, I've been involved with the Staff Pride Network for about Jonathan will probably connect me, but maybe about eight years or so. So that's all I have to say really just now. But yeah, I'd love to hear more of what Ray has to say. Uh, yeah, I mean, wow, Sarah, that's quite a tall order to follow. Um, I don't know if I feel that fancy as, as you described us. Um, yeah, my name is Ray Rosenberg. I'm a lecturer in geosciences uh, in human geography at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I've been here, well, uh, physically here for not as long as I've been teaching here. Uh, I've been teaching here since uh, 2020, July, 2020. So quite new, 
Um, I'm a queer geographer. My research is focused on power and marginalization and resistance within LGBTQ2 plus communities, a different acronym uh, that changes based on kind of where I'm doing the research. Happy to talk about that. Um, and uh, yeah, really looking at the ways that power unfolds amongst different uh, communities within the that large spectrum of queerness and transness. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. I guess it's been thank you. Happy LGBTQ History Month. And uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah, for the invitation and Jonathan and the Staff Pride Network for organizing this. I'm, I'm excited. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Uh, so I think we're going to hear from Sharon, you, uh, unless there's any, um, anything you want from me before. Um, and I think I'll turn off my camera while you're presenting, um, but I'll, I'll come back. I promise. Okay. Thank you. I lost you in the middle there, Sarah, but, um, that's, that's okay. I think I got the gist of what's going on. Let me just try and share my screen. Um, okay, so this is honestly like a mad dash through like kind of the history of queer theory, um, which I thought I'd do just to give us a sense of like how queer theory has come about um, and maybe a little bit about queer legal theory at the end, but and then hand over to Ray for some more discussion of how that plays out in, in the geographical context or geographies context. Um, so yeah, so I just, I wanted to say first of all that there is um, quite a lot of um, history to queer theory. It's been built on a lot of different sort of theoretical um, traditions, if you like. And I've just given a, a little kind of snapshot of them here, feminism, sexuality work, and then LGB sexuality and civil rights work. And the, because of the T came later, um, and then sex, sexuality, and queer studies, which came about through social constructionism and postmodernism. Um, I thought I would just to say a little bit at the end about queer politics and theory. Um, so, the evolution of queer, then the first kind of body of work that I would say kind of emerged from was actually second wave feminism, as it's sometimes called. Some people don't like that description, but basically the kind of feminism that developed from the late 60s through the 70s, um, which began to theorize women's sexuality as being part of the patriarchal oppression of women. And so um, not only did gender have to be uh, theorized, but also sexuality um, too, and that the two actually should be theorized together because actually both of them are socially produced in the sense that they come about through um, social interactions and through not benign social processes, but I've, as I've said there, through the power of male dominance, such that women's sexuality couldn't be understood even by women themselves uh, with this, this framework of, of patriarchal oppression. Um, and because of that, um, theorists, feminist theorists like um, um, Catherine McKinnon and, and so on, who worked within the legal context, argued that patriarchal structures like the law left no room for alternative understandings of women's sexualities out with that heterosexual frame. And that led also to a particular strand of second wave feminism, um, lesbian feminism, and the writings of Adrienne Rich, Monique Wittig, Audre Lorde, Bell Hooks, and others, who started to um, theorize uh, very closely the emergence of, of female sexuality. So that was one kind of strand. Um, another strand which was going on in parallel at the same time, although interestingly the two did not seem to kind of talk to each other, um, was LGB rights activism. And as I said before, the T wasn't added until later. But this was a kind of activism in Western Europe and North America that was based on a kind of civil rights model fighting on the basis of identity politics and the argument that um, we are just like you. So as in homosexuals are just like heterosexuals, uh, as the argument went at the time. And underpinning that kind of approach in, in, in that period was this idea that sexuality is something that you're born with. And if I was feeling more musical right now, I'd probably go into a bit of Lady Gaga here. Um, but the idea was partly developed as a right strategy 
um, to argue against LGB discrimination because if you could show that people were born that way, then they couldn't be blamed for their sexual preferences, they couldn't be discriminated against, you couldn't criminalise same-sex behaviour and so on. So you've got feminist sexuality work and LGB sexuality and civil rights work happening in tandem with some crossover but very little in practice. Then we move into a kind of era of the theoretical development of some of these ideas through the framing of social constructionism, which tried to explain this kind of aspect of social interaction that I was talking about earlier, how individuals participate in the construction of their own realities and how those constructed realities become seen as norms and they're concretized, they become traditions, they become very kind of enshrined and invested in as if they're reality, even though they are social constructs. And no conversation about this would be complete without mentioning Foucault, of course, um, and his very important work uh, on uh, sexuality, discussing how um, the acts that um, homosexuals engaged in would have been termed in the 19th century sodomy, um, but by the um, late 19th century, a combination of powerful discourses like law and medicine began to talk about homosexuality as a category of people that needed treatment rather than a set of acts that people engaged in. Um, and of course, little kind of picture of Michel Foucault there, um, hero of the social constructionist movement. Um, his work on uh, sexuality is, is uh, always cited in this context. I just want to put a little footnote there to the, um, the uh, critique of feminists that um, Michel Foucault didn't really account for female sexuality and gender in his um, understandings of how these things uh, came about. Um, but feminist work has taken his ideas and run with them in a way that is actually quite interesting and helpful for understanding um, how sexuality and sex um, have become powerful mechanisms through which um, the state exercises a form of biopower or biopolitical power over populations. That's actually like really bad Foucault in 30 seconds, but um, we can come back to that in questions if you like. Um, so this kind of constructionist framework um, for sexuality did open up a really um, interesting discursive space um, where more fluidity, notions of fluidity and contingency were able to step in um, and kind of contradict this previous idea that sexuality was something you were born with. And as the 90s progressed, following on from that constructionist approach um, and the radical feminist approach, um, came a more uh, postmodern turn. No postmodern talk on sexuality would complete without a picture of Judith Butler. Um, and uh, again, we could talk about her at great length, but I'll, I'll leave the in-depth stuff to one side just to say that her work has been very influential and very important in understanding sex, gender and sexuality, um, not only because of her contributions, her contributions to the development of queer theory and queer studies, but also in terms of her contribution to understanding how gender is a performance and how sex and sexuality become tied up in that idea of performance, again, in such a way that we invest in it as if it were real, um, but actually it is one of those kind of performative aspects of social life that we over invest in and 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 tend to um uh see as concrete with, without actually questioning those aspects of sex gender and sexuality that are both connected to each other and again connected to the state and powerful discourses like law and medicine so this is probably Queer 101, um, and it comes from Queer A Graphic History, which is a really lovely book by Meg John Barker and Julia Scheel about what queer actually means. Can it be a noun, an adjective, a verb, and it can be all three? And how queer studies began to challenge ideas like heterosexism and began to develop ideas like heteronormativity and homonormativity as key concepts in questioning um, traditional understandings of sex, sexuality and gender. And just a little definition there, heteronormativity, um, meaning norms that are expressed through social practices and structures that assume the naturalness 
of a hierarchical binary model where heterosexuality is implied and assumed through social institutions like marriage and so on. And then this idea of homonormativity that Lisa Duggan developed where um, gay politics uh, or LGBTQ politics, maybe without the Q, have come to kind of mirror heterosexual kind of norms and practices in a way that maybe can be strategic for LGBT rights, but doesn't contest um, or undermine the dominant heterosexual assumptions that pervade through society, like, for example, marriage. Um, and so queer politics is really a confrontation of the kind of identity politics of LGBT, uh, LGB politics of the 60s and 70s and the feminist radical kind of politics of sexuality to say that queerness is a form of resistance to these heteronormative and homonormative ideas of um, social institutions like marriage and so on. And rather than accommodating and assimilating and um, aiming to be just like you, queerness is about, as Michael Warner said, resistance to regimes of the normal. So um, this idea, I love that last quote on the slide, not gay as in happy, but queer as in fuck you. Um, and I think that just really sums up uh, the difference in approach between a queer politics and an LGB rights-based politics of the 60s and 70s. So it's against this identity politics idea, it's against the idea of liberal assimilationism, it was in part prompted by the AIDS epidemic. Again, we could talk about that history separately. And it's confrontational and anti-normative. That's the basic um, uh, foundation of what it, what it means to be queer and to engage in queer activism. Some critiques of queer from the inside have come from the people of colour, queer of colour communities and crip queer communities um, who have critiqued queer politics and theory as being a reproduction of a kind of male, white, able-bodied kind of politics. And I think that Ray might say something more about that possibly. Um, and just thinking it for the last couple of um, minutes, sorry, I've zoomed through this about, so what is queer legal theory then? How, how does law fit into this? Um, how would a person interested in law like myself be able to incorporate a queer perspective? And these kind of three aspects of queer legal theory, I think are quite helpful to focus on for um, what can queer theory do for us, let's say. <laughs> so um, queer theory for law helps us to focus on how law defines and treats identity, gender identity, sex identity, sexual orientation, sexuality, and it points to discrimination and equality in these areas about what law is and what it does. And that is the descriptive empirical role of queer legal theory. It can show us what law does. But it also has a normative role in showing us like when we uncover these heteronormative assumptions and values in law, how we can critique that and build theories of how the how the world should be if we were actually taking a queer lens rather than a heterosexual or heteronormative or homonormative lens. And then finally, this idea about um, an epistemological um, tool for law. So queer theory can ask how we how we come to know about law, how we understand law, what are the framings that we use and the methods that we use to understand law and how law produces sexual subjects. So that's basically queer legal theory. And I just wanted to leave you with a couple of just quotes about how this this this, for example, is a quote about um, the same sex marriage drive um, which started in Canada a lot earlier than here because it's been um, the law has been um, permissive of same-sex marriage in Canada for a lot longer that these ideologies of marriage are not challenged by a same-sex marriage movement that wants to um, uh, replicate rights um, on the basis of what's already in existence rather than challenging the very existence of those laws themselves and um, just a lovely little picture to end with, which is when uh, the same-sex marriage um, debate in the US culminated in, in finally in movement on same-sex marriage, and it was allowed in the in the um, I've forgotten the state in which it was brought, California, I think. Um, the New Yorker produced this front page of um, what could be more comforting and homey and familiar than a picture of Eric and Ernie um, uh, from Sesame Street um, or. Um, the Muppets um, cozying up together in a very 
a homonormative way on the sofa watching TV together. Um, I'll stop there. There's loads more I can say, but I just want to hand over to Ray because I know that Ray will have lots of really interesting things to say about how these issues are played out in, in critical uh, queer geographies. Thanks, Sharon. That was amazing. That I, I need to talk to you about how you condensed queer theory like that in such a short amount of time. That was amazing. Um, yeah, and so and I I want lots of time for discussions and conversations. So I won't I won't talk too much. Um, but um, yeah, I think Sharon made some really or laid the foundation for some points that I was going to be making anyway. Um, I thought I would maybe start by explaining kind of the emergence of queer geographies because it's actually a particular field and there are tensions around it. Um, in the the 90s that the turn to uh to postmodernism the real turn towards uh thinking around queerness um in the late 1990s some geographers started to critically engage with ideas of sexuality in human geography it hadn't really been done before. And that field is actually called geographies of sexualities. And over a few, I, I would say about 10 years, so probably 95 to 2005 or so, geographies of sexualities was the term that was being used for geographers who were engaging in research that had to do with uh, not only queer sexualities, but mostly lesbian, bisexual, gay folks and communities. Um, around 2005, we started to see an emergence of queer geographies. Um, and what's interesting is that the initial emergence of geographies of sexualities was pushing back against queer theory a bit. There was discomfort around the ways that um, queerness was thought as so theoretical, as so um, a, a kind of a, a, a theoretical framework for understanding the world that the lived realities of then LGB people were being erased. They weren't being accounted for. And these theories weren't necessarily being based in the lived experiences of queer communities. And so that was the pushback from within geography to really look at the material uh, lived experiences of queer people. And then there was a pushback again in uh, around 2005 within the field of geographies of sexualities. Um, and it was basically saying, we, we can't just toss away queer theory, because what's actually started to happen in this field is the only people who are getting written about are white, gay, cis men. These intersections that were foundational to the development of queer theory have been erased. So we need to pull queer theory back into our scholarship, our ways of thinking, our ways of conducting research in order to account for these intersectionalities. Um, we need to be talking about the experiences of trans people and queer and trans people of color and indigenous people. These all need to be happening and we need this connection to queer theoretical frameworks in order for that to work. So there's a bit of a split still, there's some tension between queer geographies and geographies of sexualities. They both actually still exist kind of uh, alongside each other, a little bit separate. I wouldn't really say they're separate, but there are tensions there. Um, earlier, I said that I am a queer geographer. I call myself that because, um, well, I work with LGBTQ2 plus communities. Um, I really use queer theory to think through ideas of race and colonialism and how they overlap with sexuality and gender. So how ideas um, and the treatment of race, how experiences of colonialism permeate different 
queer, trans, and two-spirit communities. Um, and two-spirit here is a, an indigenous term used in North America uh, to describe uh, non-normative gender and sexual identities and expressions amongst indigenous peoples. Um, so I really use queer theory in a way to, to push for that really deep, rich intersection uh, that has continued to be to, to be missed in uh, in queer geographical scholarship, despite the pushes uh, to to do that intersectional work. Um, I think I actually what's funny is that I I pulled um, I pulled a quote that kind of is similar to the Michael Warner quote that you had Sharon from Lee Edelman uh, that queerness names the side outside the consensus. So really pushing the boundaries to, uh, as Bell Hooks has written about them, look at the margins, who is left on the margins, who has been forgotten. Um, and so that's what, what I find really useful in, in kind of employing queer theory as someone who's a trained social scientist. Um, and I do have some background in queer theory, but not nearly the background that Sharon, you, you clearly have, um, which I think can be really interesting uh, and, and productive. I did see a question that went into the, the chat that I just think is kind of relevant to what I've been talking about a bit um, around the tensions between trans studies um, and the ideas about trans rights on one hand, queer politics on the other, and I imagine queer theory. Um, this has also happened within queer geographies. I, would, I, I think this is like a, a microcosm of the larger kind of queer studies world, um, is that there has also been a push similar within queer studies for trans studies for trans geographies to work specifically with trans communities because what often happens within politics and scholarship is the T is an it's just an addendum. It's but it it's just there. It's kind of it's empty. It doesn't it's meaningless. Um, and when when you're as a scholar, when you're writing about sexuality. Well, are you talking about trans people and trans people's sexualities and non-binary people's sexualities? Or are you just lumping that into a category? And what happens is that it's missed. Those really important details of trans experiences are missed. Um, what, I, what I think is, and I'm curious, Sharon, if you have any thoughts on this. Um, there are, I would say there might be tensions, but I, I've kind of read them as working together. So the development of queer studies and trans studies has kind of blossomed into this really interesting mix of, of just theory in general. Um, I found it to be quite generative um, and kind of mutually informing each other. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not too aware of like very intense kind of um, splits between queer studies and trans studies. I've kind of seen them working and developing together. Um, Sharon, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that's a super interesting question. I, I think, I think I'm not sure who, who asked the question, but I can see the question, but I, I was gonna say that um, for me, the this this sort of tension is actually between people who are not necessarily between trans studies and trans rights on the one hand and queer politics on the other but maybe between people who are focusing on for whatever reason for for strategic or for whatever reason people who are focusing on rights-based claims whether they're trans rights claims or whatever and people who are want to undermine rights-based claims because they are pro like fundamentally problematic because they buy they have to buy into all sorts of concepts and ideas about um 
you know, group identity or individual identity and the relationship between an individual and the state and so on to be able to actually make a rights-based claim. So those tensions definitely exist and they exist in queer, queer theory and queer politics um, versus maybe queer activism on the one hand um, and also within, I think, all sorts of other communities, including feminist communities, trans communities and so on. Um, so it's, it's really about whether or not people what people are aiming for and I did have a slide which I didn't show because there were like 3463 slides in my slideshow um, and it actually does talk about um, the idea that comes from critical race theory about whether it's possible to buy into an idea of something like an identity or a right for strategic reasons, but also at the same time be undermining the foundations of the idea of what is a right in the first place and whether you can actually do both of those things at the same time, which was a very important idea that emerged from critical race theory in the 80s and 90s. And, um, and I think from what I can see, there are people working in queer activism, stroke politics, stroke theory, who are trying to do that. Some of them are in the trans community, some of them are elsewhere in the community. But um, yeah, so for me, I would say that's the tension. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, oh, I've gone much darker than it was. <laughs> I suppose that's night time. Um, oh, yeah, I actually was going to ask about critical race theory because I feel like uh, queer theory and critical race theory have a similar kind of experience like of the media like having a bit of a moral panic about it because the message about it hasn't come through very uh, clearly because, you know, a lot in, the case, in a lot of cases it is because people are interpreting it in a way that is kind of politically expedient for them um but i wondered you've already spoken to it a little bit um but if you have anything to say about that uh, and also i'll take the moment to remind the audience if you've got any questions please do pop them in the q a but i have lots of questions so we won't be short of questions either way <laughs> yeah i mean and i i can i can start off um so <laughs> I, what I found quite useful about working with, I work with critical race theory quite a lot alongside uh, queer, queer and trans studies. Um, what I have found particularly productive is, is the ways that both bodies of literature identify how subjectivities and bodies are, uh, well, this may be speaking to a very specific um, area of studies, but are, are either allowed entry into the state to be recognized as subjects to be granted the right to live, uh, the right to citizenship, the right of, of recognition, and those who are relegated to, to die or to be left to the margins. Um, I'm thinking of this term necropolitics, which kind of is, works alongside biopolitics. Um, so, you know, mechanisms to keep cer certain populations alive, biopolitics or biopower, um, and to regulate life, and necropolitics and necropower to uh, maintain certain populations at either the brink of death or, or to cause literal uh death and so there are these questions about subjectivity itself who has the right to be a subject that i think are quite uh significant and mutually informed um the moral panic is quite interesting i mean this past summer uh there was a huge moral panic about critical race studies in the u.s um, that was kind of shockingly, I don't know, it just emerged. It was, it was quite bizarre. I started getting questions from uh, family members who I uh, don't particularly like about uh, critical race theory. And I was like, where did they, what, where is this coming from? Like, it's quite strange. Um, and I think you see that a lot too, these moral panics around trans rights. Uh, trans access to 
faith. Um, there is a fundamental questioning in, in both of these moral panics about this idea of who has the right to claim space, to, to claim personhood. Um, and that's really what I think, I mean, queer of color critique has produced some incredible work that explores this. Um, I, I mean, Roderick Ferguson, also Jose Esteban Munoz, uh, just uh, incredible pieces that explore this in some really interesting ways in performance studies, um, mostly the humanities, uh, which doesn't mean that social scientists can't get anything from it. And I would, I get a lot from it. Um, yeah, Sharon, I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that. Yeah, it was just as you were talking there, Ray, I was thinking about also the literature that's come primarily from the US or the North American context about the um, prison industrial complex and the way that um, that that idea of necropolitics that you were talking about and kind of bare life and so on has also been subject to critique. Um, but again, a lot of that work coming from uh, scholars of color who are who are critique, critiquing penal policy, but from that very particular kind of perspective of how subjectivities are produced, racialized, kept at the bare minimum of life and so on. Um, so yeah, that's what I was thinking as, as you were talking there. Yeah, there's a lot of fascinating work coming from, I guess it's, maybe it's critical queer legal studies, I'm not sure what, or, and also trans legal studies too, um, but often from queer and trans scholars of color, um, just really, really fascinating overlaps there. I, I have so many questions and they're also complicated. <laughs> I was thinking about how um, geography kind of, I mean, actually, I don't know very much about human geography, so I might be talking nonsense, but both of your disciplines kind of deal with, I think a lot of people have uh, trouble with the idea of gender as a performance and find it almost insulting. But I think a lot of things are performative, like the law is performative and, you know, the state is performative. Um, I wonder if, yeah, you could speak to kind of that sort of misunderstanding and mismatch and also how queer theory helps us kind of reckon with these things and their pseudo reality. I don't know. you. You'll, you'll know what I'm talking about, hopefully, and <laughs> say something more concise. Yeah, I do you want me to kick it off, Ray? I could kick off a little bit here. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I think I'm going to be flipping it and say that maybe Judith Butler's idea of performativity has go, just goes to go down in history as one of the most misunderstood ideas of all time. But um, so, especially now where she's being wheeled out as the kind of sort of, you know, the antithesis of all things good and common sense about the world of sex and gender by some people who are really um, in in one of those moral panics, as you were saying, Ray, about how the world is being undone by gender theorists like Judith Butler. Um, when Judith Butler has been around since like the late 80s, um, so this is not new stuff. But anyway, all of that aside, um, yeah, I, I was really fascinated by this idea when I was doing my PhD thesis about this idea of gender being performance and performativity and so on because it's it's what she's not saying is that you can get up in the morning open your wardrobe decide what gender you want to be and put that gender coat on and then go out into the world and be that gender that's not what she's saying she's saying there are very few options available to us in society you can't just go out and decide to be like a pink blanche flavored gender right because we only have well, you might try, but you won't be recognizable. So that, that thing about recognition that Ray was talking about earlier, um, we can we have a very constrained set of frameworks to un, in which to understand ourselves, our genders, and other people's genders. And when she's talking about performance, she's saying gender is not something natural that just happens to us. It's something that we do. And we get up and we do it every day over and over and over again. And that's the performance aspect of it is that we are constantly kind of 
iterating and reiterating an idea of gender in the world. So it's us that are constructing it. But that does not mean to say that we can just, without thinking about it and without any effort, unthink it and undo it because it's kind of out there in the world already. And so the idea of um, agency for Butler is not, it's a really complicated idea. It, it doesn't mean that you can, you know, if we have agency, it doesn't mean that we can do anything we want at any time because we're already in a very complex network of systems, but we can exercise some agency in how we understand those things and, and do those things. So the idea of permit performance and performativity is tied up in those contexts of not not complete free choice and not all flavors of gender anywhere that can be chosen and done but within some kind of room for maneuver which is how she gets to the originally how she gets to the, the idea of drag and then later on she talks a lot more about transness and gender identity and so on those are all places where she th says that, you know, they're still constrained. They're very heavily constrained, particularly transness by law and medicine and so on. But there are some spaces somewhere to try to for maneuver. It's, it's built, it's again, it's built on a kind of very Foucauldian idea of power as well. The power is not all encompassing. It's not completely overwhelming such that we have no agency, but nor is it the case that we can just decide to do and perform whatever we want at any time so I don't again that's probably like you know Butler in two minutes she'd probably have a heart attack if she heard me describing her work like that but I think that's kind of a sort of a fair way of describing it in a short period of time because it's definitely a lot better than if I tried to give you my half remembered gender troubles <laughs> spark notes so <laughs> thank you for being here <laughs> Ray did you want to to speak to any of that um, I mean, again, incredible summary of Butler. I won't even try to uh, attempt to add anything coherent to that. Um, but I will say, I mean, you know, also like race is performed in a, you know, all, all different parts of who we are uh, are performed. Um, and it's, it's, this idea has manifest itself and it's just, it's kind of in all of these different theories now just about um, even just being in space. So as a geographer kind of thinking about, well, what are the, what are the kinds of social relations, the dynamics that are taking place in a given location? Um, what are the cultural discourses that we can see taking place in, in a certain location? So in my, my PhD research with, um, LGBTQ2 plus youth who are experiencing homelessness in Toronto and Canada, um, I had a particular focus in the gay village and the most dynamic and rich interviews that I had were when we did walking interviews through the village. And I could actually observe how uh, race, gender, sexuality, uh, homelessness were all performed in a very unique way even in different locations throughout this small you know span of, of a few city blocks um, and so I think it's really quite rich to think about uh, in terms of again it's, you know my work thinking about power and how power unfolds in social relations performativity of any aspect of who we are is, is so important and it speaks to these kinds of larger structures of power that are dominating the world that we inhabit. Oh, Jonathan has his hand up. <laughs> Hello, Jonathan. There we go. Hi, yeah, I just, um, I realized that because I'm, uh, I am have this like uh, admin uh, access that I can't put in, anything into Q&A to ask a question. Um, and uh, I just want, uh, I think uh, there are a lot of people uh, who are members of Staff Pride Network uh, who identify as queer. And uh, I just wondered when we're talking about queer theory and what queer means to each of you and uh, whoever wants to answer that. Uh, and if anyone on the, uh, anyone um, in the audience would like to answer that as well, 
uh, just uh, let us know and we can uh, bring you up as well. But, uh, Ray, and I, I don't remember hearing about like any of your background, Ray, uh, at the start, because like Sharon explained about herself uh, and then you, you know, continued on, um, if I can. Oh, like my, like my academic background? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of boring. I'm just a geographer through and through. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a, yeah, my, all of my degrees are in geography. I, I do have a, um, I did, took a graduate option in uh, gender and feminist studies at McGill University and uh, did some development in, a, in sexuality studies with, um, uh, critical race theory and psychoanalysis uh, during my PhD. But those are kind of the only more interesting bits about me. Um, but I think in terms of kind of what queerness or queer means, uh, there to me at least there's a there's a scholar whose work I really love named uh, Martin Manalanson. And he's written a lot about queer as mess. And I really love that idea of, of queer as a verb, as an adjective, as a noun, as mess. It's messy. There's some, there's disruption, there's disturbance happening. And there's all of this, uh, this beauty and complication and nuance in the mess. And I, I think about that in, um, in my work, in my personal life, uh, not not saying that I'm a mess, um, but actually to push to push myself towards mess. I'm a Capricorn. I kind of I I'm driven to orderliness, uh, and I try to to push back on those tendencies by thinking about these these theoretical ideas of of queer as as mess. And I do love the you know queers and fuck you that has driven most of my life. Um, <laughs> I see Sharon kind of nodding a bit. Yeah, I'd love that idea that, it, um, that, that that would be, that would drive most of your life. It's just, yeah, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I, I don't know about geography. I don't really know enough about the discipline to know whether standard geography, whatever that is, feels constra constraining. I suppose it's so tied up with colonial history geography, isn't it? And but I don't know what contemporary geographies are, is like. But I mean, law is like, of course, another one of those disciplines that's absolutely intertwined with colonialism and is a very constraining space. And now it's 10, 10 to 6. I don't really care who hears this. I Like Edinburgh University is quite a old fashioned traditional university and the law school is quite a conservative law school. So it's been interesting for me working within a law school and being just being a kind of LGBT rights kind of a person would be challenging, I think, in some of these spaces. But if you're going to add the Q on and be like more what, you know, Michael Warner was talking about being confrontational and resistance to the regimes of the normal and so on, then it's, it can be quite a lonely space to be in. Um, and, you know, especially if for lots of good reasons, the people who are in your communities are people who are trying to get rights. You know, it's really easy for me to say from the comfort of my lovely big sofa, like, you know, who needs rights? Rights suck. Like, you know, is, you know, if you're living in Russia and you're an LGBTQ person right now, I think I'd be probably like wanting quite a few rights to be kind of put down in law. Thank you very much. So the Q is a place of privilege. Like, I think sometimes that kind of activist kind of anti-normative space that queer theory and, and queer activism has, has been in for a while is, is a place of privilege and I think that's one of the things that you were saying earlier Ray that I really connected with about trying to step outside of that space because any space of privilege just ends up being um, a place where all of those power structures get reproduced um, and so just to keep coming back to that idea of like questioning your own, being reflexive about your own position in a discipline and in a in a in a theoretical framework and the way that you use your activism and your knowledge, and not to reproduce those structures of power, but to um to try to resist the regimes of the normal. But it's all it's very context specific, isn't it? 
as I said, like it's what resisting my regimes in the normal in my context is what are very different to what it might mean in Moscow right now, for example. Yeah, and I, I think too, like there is a there is a, a a very important relationship between queer, uh, especially thinking about rights discourses and rights pushes for rights, um, kind of that that more confrontational idea of queerness it often pushes rights discourses to be more inclusive. Um, but I, yeah, I completely. Agree, Sharon. I and I just wanted to. I I saw a, a few questions, but um, <clears throat> there was one about just advice for students for looking to use queer theory in your projects. Um, definitely, feel free to send me an email at least. But also, like I teach a queer geographies class. Um, that I th any any anyone can basically enroll in. You don't have to be in geography. Um, to you know, to at least kind of start perusing through through the theory, um, and then I saw another one. Oh, there's a question about artists, but just related to this idea of projects um, in terms of home. There is some interesting work in geography on LGBTQ plus youth and home, so. Um, play around with the search terms. Um, I, Christopher Schroeder, I think his name is, has, he's written some really great pieces. Uh, they're, they're a bit dated, but still really good. I wanted to say, I really like the idea of uh, queer as mess. I think I really like it as an umbrella term partly because it does allow that space for kind of intersectionality and messiness and not being too sure like where you fit. I think there's there's power in naming things and there's a big usefulness in labels, but it's also quite limiting. Um, and I mean, let's not start talking about Derrida because number one, I'll embarrass myself even further and it's just not the time or the place. But, but I think, yeah, there's something about queer which allows for all sorts of, yeah, not even definitions being undefinable and I think it's a really valuable lens um on on the topic of uh, recommended resources is there anything you'd recommend like in terms of non-academic reading or kind of accessible reading because I think it's important that like it's a two-way flow of information um if you know what I mean This is where I'm going to be useless. Because my PhD ruined my love of reading. <laughs> oh, look, I, if you're thinking like something that's not academic and is quite accessible um, and really interesting based on a kind of combination of like someone's kind of autobiographical experiences, but a little bit of kind of it's a really interesting format format, actually, with a little bit of theory kind of in there is um, Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts, um, which is a really great book to read. It's not an academic book, it's but it's really, it's, she, what she does is she kind of pulls out the bits of the book where she um, is influenced by theory and sort of keeps them at the side or at the bottom to say like, oh, this idea I had was because I read this book. But it's a really nice, um, it's really nice contemporary un, sort of unpicking of some of the current debates around gender, gender identity, um, sexuality and stuff. That's a really good book. Um, if you're looking for something as a way into something academic, then the the book that I talked about before, which is um, A Graphic Guide to Queer Theory by um, Meg John Barker and Julia Sh uh, Sheppel, I can't remember her surname, sorry, um, is a really nice way because it's graphic, so it's lots of cartoons, um, but it's also really um, accessible in terms of the language it uses to describe the concepts and so on. So I definitely recommend that as well. There have been some uh, contributions in the uh, chat that we can see, um, but you can't. Uh, that, uh, for example, uh, Kent Monkman is an amazing two-spirit artist based in Canada. Uh, 
that uh, Ray put in here, that uh, their artwork embodies queerness in a way that connects to how I understand it theoretically. Um, and there was also another comment about uh, detransition, uh, baby. Uh, Travis Alabanza, Paul Preciado, Please Miss by Grace Lavery. Um, then, uh, and, I, did, uh, I, just, I just want to second to Travis Alabanza um, reference there, whose work I've seen on stage during the festival a couple of years ago, and they are just incredible. Well, we'll see if we can get them on at some point. <laughs> Uh, I just, uh, I sorry, sorry. I just want to add to this. So there's a comment in there by, uh, I think it's by Peter, about the point of queerness, um, and it's the the fuck you paradigm that kind of embodies your experiences as a black queer man. Um, you might find um, Ferguson's book Aberrations in Black uh, to be really, I, it's it's theory. But I, it doesn't strike me as super inaccessible theory. Um, and it's just a really, really foundational text that I think speaks to experiences of queerness and blackness together um, in a really, really powerful way. I didn't want to let that go. Sorry, no, I'm glad you didn't. It was a, it was a good recommendation. Thank you. <laughs> No, that was perfect. That was the next thing I was about to read out. So you did it for me. Um, I, uh, I'm not quite sure who 8493124072 is, uh, but uh, they, uh, they uh, have mentioned that Grace, is, Grace Lavery is coming to Edinburgh on April the 4th. Um, and uh, then uh, <laughs> that, uh, yeah. It, there might be something that we know about, but uh, we haven't uh, finalized details or launched or anything. So uh, that's very mysterious, <laughs> very oh. defying boundaries there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Edward uh, put in an Edinburgh writer wrote about queerness and loss, uh, Pothos by Rosa Campbell. Uh, it's similar to Maggie Nelson's Argonauts in style and thoroughly recommended and I love a smiley face so thank you Edward for that. I love a pothos, I have a pothos in my flat and it's not very happy but I love it all the same so I, I'm keen to read that for other reasons but also because I'm yeah <laughs> the house plank connection. There's wow. also I'm just going to do a plump for a really amazing Scottish writer Jackie uh, Jackie Kay. Um, who's a poet, but she also wrote a really amazing novel called Trumpet, um, which is about, um, actually, I'm not going to tell you what it's about because it's going to ruin a part of the story. But um, yeah, Jackie Kay, Trumpet, beautiful book. You have to read that. I'm glad we brought the discussion home to literature because all of my knowledge of queer theory, more or less, is gleaned either from Tumblr and Twitter or from my English literature professors from my undergrad. So... I feel, feel back at home again. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, is there anything that uh, either of our panelists would like to say to uh, close off? Um, there's, uh, unless there are, I was going to say any more questions or anything that comes in. Um, there's, uh, and just as I do that, um, an anonymous attendee, uh, uh, asks uh, what they describe as a broad question. Uh, touching on what Sharon was saying about queer being a space of privilege in terms of rights. I know this is a bit of a broad question, but I wondered what your thoughts are on queer theories, complicated relationship with the gender binary, as in my limited experience, this can be quite an area of tension uh, with trans studies. I remember a quote from something I read Apologies for not citing properly. I can't remember exactly where it came from right now. That was something like trans studies acknowledges that gender is real like this, but not like this. Whereas queer theory wants to totally dismantle the gender binary. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm glad Sharon's mentioned in that comment. <laughs> I know you're an excellent person to, uh, 
answer that. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that, I don't know the quote actually. Um, but I don't, I don't know, Sarah. Were you going to? It says on my little screen, Sarah Bernard is going to answer this question live. But maybe that's not what was happening. Oh, I, I, I clicked that on your behalf. <laughs> okay, right. Okay. Um, um, it's in the chat. Uh, someone says, I think the quote is from Hale Keegan. Okay. Okay. Um, so yeah. So I. Again, I, I suppose my my feeling is that it's really hard to generalize about trans studies because there's so many different kinds of strands to trans studies now. That's quite difficult to say. That um, there might be um, some scholars working in trans studies that want to kind of invest in certain kinds of strategies or ideas or concepts that other people working in trans studies wouldn't. So I, I just want to be careful about it. So someone like Judith Jack Halberstam, for example, um, would be more kind of critical um, of some of the work by maybe people who are doing kind of trans rights scholarship. Um, so um, I guess this is going back to what I was talking about earlier is that trans, any kind of rights based claims or strategies kind of have to, at least for a temporary period of time invest in an idea of identity from which to kind of make those rights claims because that's how the law works it requires groups of people or individuals to have particular characteristics and so you to make use of those um rights you have to have you have to ex you have to um display those characteristics and ad ad adopt and embrace those characteristics whereas i mean queer queer studies i think is very much of the kind of historical roots of um, not necessarily there there's no such thing as reality but just poking around in what is reality so if we're if we're investing in the idea of marriage um, and then we open it up to same-sex marriage let's just be a bit cautious and critical of whether anything has actually shifted within the core idea of marriage when we do that is it actually doing or is it, you know, what kind of work is the concept of marriage doing, even when it's working in a same-sex marriage context? I suppose it links to what some people have called kind of pink washing, which is where a state takes its pro-LGBTQ policies like same-sex marriage or allowing gays and lesbians to serve in the military or whatever the policy might be, and using that to cast itself as a state that values human rights and equality while it's also doing lots of other things that undermine human rights and equality. Um, so using the kind of LGBT um, progressiveness, and we can question whether that whether it is progressive, but using their stance on LGBT equality to kind of cover over other really problematic aspects of their their um, stance, stance on human rights or anything else that they could be doing. So what am I saying? I'm saying that um, some strategies will buy into those ideas because they need to for the particular political or social gain that they want to get but queer is never the, the idea of queer where it came from and this is the problem that Ray was talking about about it becoming sort of co-opted or mainstreamed or whatever but the original idea of queer is that whenever something becomes settled that's the moment at which you have to question it and dismantle it and critique it and deconstruct it and that doesn't mean that there's no such thing as reality it just means we have to be really suspicious of the things that we think are are, are real like gender for example I'm not sure I explained that very well but it's probably because my brain has stopped working <laughs> yeah I would yeah and I would just I, I I think it's important to remember trans studies at this point is is quite uh I mean, it's not a large field, but it's pretty substantial. Um, and there will be disagreements amongst scholars. Um, but in general, I don't, I don't think that I'm, I'm not familiar uh, with a kind of tension around kind of, you know, one area believes in the gender binary and the other believes in dismantling it. Um, I'm not familiar with that. I, I think there probably would have been a time when um, some of the 
political activism around trying to get, for example, the Gender Recognition Act in place, some of that activism would have used the strategy of the narrative is that people are born in the wrong body, we have to allow people to change their bodies in order for people to do that. And for some people that was a real experiential thing and for some people it wasn't, but they recognised that in order to get medical treatment, they had to go to the doctor and say that, whether they believed it or not. So there's, so that would have been a moment in time, for example, where there might have been a divide in the way that um, different folk within the trans community would have understood or and or used ideas of gender and gender identity in ways that might seem in tension or in conflict. Yeah. Yeah, that, that chimes with kind of my understanding of how that sort of uh, discourse tends to go. And in some ways, I mean, yeah, you were referencing Lady Gaga at, at the start, of, at the beginning of this evening. And it is like, you know, I, I'm in a same-sex relationship and it's been a long time since anybody asked us like which is the man and which is the woman but it is like a construct that people have in their heads and I think it's kind of similar in some ways yeah it's just anytime we try to identify within these boundaries or you know we don't want to identify within these boundaries but we encounter them and there's like kind of administrative and legal way legal kind of places we need to put ourselves in and I feel like yeah, having queer theory as a lens to understand that that's going on and that we don't we can like agitate against it is really really helpful to me certainly and I think that's one really like clear way in that kind of queer theory becomes less theoretical and more like this is affecting kind of LGBTQ plus people's day-to-day -day lives. I mean can I just say I didn't go into this in any detail but just as a last comment and then I'll shut my brain down for good but um Queer theory grew out of queer activism, not the other way around. So, like, queer, I mean, is that true? I'm now questioning whether that's actually true. Maybe they sort of interwove and happened kind of around the same time, but um, it's the same with feminism. The two are kind of mutually re reinforcing and kind of woven together. But queer activism was very much about in your face, you know, that kind of fuck you thing that we were talking about earlier and the kind of very... Um, not the kind of pleading for rights, but turning up in places that they shouldn't be and lying down in the ground and pretending to be dead to mm -hmm. disrupt traffic and releasing, a bit like the Gay Liberation Front did in the 70s, like releasing mice in churches and stuff like that. They did disruptive things um, deliberately to do this kind of anti-normative resistance work. Um, and that's, I think, what I was talking about earlier and Ray was talking about earlier without putting words in your mouth, Ray, about trying to cap keep capturing that spirit of resistance um within the idea rather than you know becoming either um complacent or complicit in a kind of co-opting of the idea because you often see like lgbtq or you know um queer eye for the straight guy i have mean, nothing against queer eye for the straight guy but that queer eye for the straight guy is a kind of co-opting or mainstreaming of the word queer in a way that probably was never really intended to be used but then on the other hand there's so many not rules in queerness and in queer theory that you know it's difficult to say well that's not what it was intended for that's not the rule because the whole idea is that everything's a mess as Ray said so you know take it do what you want with it go do be be queer like you know interpret as you will I love it I love like yeah messy activism within the kind of academies for example that we find ourselves within <laughs> uh, Ray do you have any any closing thoughts I think that's a really perfect way of <laughs> of venting <laughs> to go out and be queer in whatever way possible I guess I would I mean this is um I am I'm not paid to promote this in any way but just because it's LGBTQ history month um I did a queer walking tour of Edinburgh in September and it was amazing. So if anyone, uh, it was part of the Fringe Festival, but then it was extended. Um, so keep your eyes out for that because it was, it was wonderful. And actually there was, um, I did learn that the building next to where my office is, used to be a bathhouse. And there was this really terrible police, uh, I don't know if he was a constable or whatnot, but he would, his mission was to 
uh, to close down the bathhouse. And he came up with terms. He came up with categories for the men who were at this bathhouse. And um, the least offensive for him in terms of people engaging in the acts were the heterosexually exhausted. This, this is an actual <laughs> term, the heterosexually exhausted. So I love that. Yeah, I feel like, you know, I, we can, I feel like we all always feel heterosexually exhausted, no matter who we are. So, <laughs> That's a very useful term. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I feel like that in the, in the, uh, I don't know, in the, in the spirit of go out and be queer. Go out and fight heterosexual exhaustion. Yeah. <laughs> Marvellous. <laughs> well I, I think yeah um on that note <laughs> thanks very much to to everybody who's come along to to find out more about queer theory and many other things besides it's been a really interesting and and kind of varied discussion and i i certainly really enjoyed being part of it so i hope it was as fun to watch as it was to participate in uh, so thanks ray thanks sharon thanks jonathan thanks to everybody else in the various different strings we have to pull to put each put each event together it's um it is a, a labor of love um but more on the love than the labor um so yeah thanks very much and happy lgbtq plus history month thanks everyone thanks everyone <laughs>